Want to make your own podcast? Spotify's got a platform that lets you make one super easy, then distribute it everywhere, and even earn money. All in one place for free. It's called Spotify for Podcasters. Here's how it works. Spotify for Podcasters lets you record and edit podcasts right from your phone or computer. So no matter what your setup is like, you can start creating today. Then you can distribute your podcast to Spotify and everywhere else podcasts are heard. Video podcasts are also available on Spotify. With Spotify for Podcasters, you can earn money in a variety of ways, including ads and podcast subscriptions. And best of all, it's totally free with no catch. Ever since I discovered Spotify for Podcasters, I feel like I have an outlet for the creativity and ideas I want to share with the world. I recommend you give it a try. We all have a voice, so share it with the world. Download the Spotify for Podcasters app or go to spotify.com slash podcasters to get started today. It was a hint. It wasn't the full hand. He showed a lot of it, but he still had an ace up his sleeve. That's why there was all the different times throughout history, Old Testament and New, the enemy was killing babies, killing babies, killing babies. There was a lot of human sacrifice and then the, the tainting of the DNA. So it was all these different attempts to stop. Now that he realized he's boxed in, there's present day attempts to stop God. For the father of lies to twist something or insert something that's not in the Bible, that is, as a believer, is a non fundamental, gives room for more error and more lies to come in. So it can be a stumbling block for those who say, Oh, well, there's no way it happened this way. Look at, look at this scientific record. And so with that error of a non-fundamental that we don't need to believe, that's not part of the gospel, it becomes an error that they put in front of believing in God. to the Days of Noah podcast, where we talk all things biblical, supernatural, and strange. This week we're going to continue our discussion, reviewing Blurry Creatures episode number 11 with Dr. Judd Burton, and we're going to get into, does the Bible teach or even allow the possibility of a pre-Adamic race by way of a so-called gap theory, or, or what some have termed ruin and restoration theory? based on some read-between-the-lines understanding of Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2. And then we're also going to discuss when did Satan fall, when were the angels created, when did they fall, and then how that plays into the hybridization program of the seed war that Satan has been undergoing since just about the beginning from Genesis 3, the curse of the serpent, the seed of the woman versus the seed of the serpent, and how that hybridization program with the Genesis 6 Watchers ties into today, and how Satan is building an army to oppose God in the end times. All right, well, welcome back, and uh, wow, episode 12 today, crazy, and we had a lot of good things to talk about last time, I think, and so we didn't get through all of um, reviewing Dr. Judd Nelson's uh, first appearance on Blurry Creatures. I think it was, what was it, episode 14, Ancient Giants. Um, so, yeah, picking up kind of where we left off, and I'll just kind of give a brief rundown. I don't think we're going to get to all this stuff, honestly, because my notes are kind of big. <laughs> But um, some of the points to go through. So we, we kind of left off last time talking about our culture today. How there's the, the relative truth of today versus, you know, truth that you can say is objectively fact. And then how we treat myths 
and and fiction and things like that because of our culture. Um, and then some other some other points that we hopefully will get to today, if if not next time. How is the biblical canon formed? That could be a, a topic in and of itself for a whole show, but we can briefly touch on it. Uh, significance of Mount Hermon. Um, and then you guys uh, have, wouldn't have gone through this, but I'm I told Luke uh, I'm listening to the Audible of Ryan Peterson's book, uh, Judgment of the Nephilim, and it's an excellent um, and study th- through the whole Old Testament of the Bible and how. Uh, God dealt with the giants. And um, so when it comes to uh, the book of Enoch and Mount Hermon, which is where uh, Enoch, the book of Enoch says this event happened in Genesis 6, um, he takes a very low view of Enoch and, um, and says that it's more likely that it was the Jordan River that would have been uh, where this event would have happened. So we'll get into some of that. And then we have uh, the Gates of Hell and the Transfiguration, which was at Mount Hermon, or Hermon, if you prefer. Um, And then uh, as some of the links I sent you guys this week, does the Bible teach or even allow the possibility of a pre-Adamic race by way of the so-called gap theory or ruin and restoration theory? Excellent question to ask because there's a lot of disagreement on that and that's totally fine because uh it's it's just interesting to discuss and see where the bible falls on that uh when did satan fall when did the other angels fall like that question keeps coming up as we talk each week because that's that's a tricky one and that plays into some of the gap theory stuff too when were the angels created what about the sons of god so some of the uh some of the ideas of maybe different classes or types or or um or job descriptions of angels is that the sons of god are perhaps a higher class or a higher job description higher rank uh separately from other angels uh how did the nephilim return after the flood was there a second incursion or was it uh through uh noah's son ham and then uh, dinosaurs after the flood. We talked about that a little bit last week with the book of, of uh, Job and God talking about behemoth. So anything right off the bat on those things that you guys want to comment on or ask? Um, I was thinking about uh, the gap theory because we kind of hit that on that last week. Um, might be a good place to start. Plus... Uh, some of the things that you shared was referencing that, um, looking at the original Hebrew language and kind of the author's or the, the commentator's opinion on that. That would might be interesting to, to talk about. Sounds good. Don, what were you going to say? I was just going to say that I'm uh, most prepared for gap theory today. Gap theory. Gap. All right. That's, that's two votes. And even if I want to start elsewhere, I can't now, you guys overruled me so uh let's let's go with that since it's most fresh in our minds and we can circle back around to uh to use the the gen Saki term there you like that don we'll circle back we'll circle back to yep. the other stuff okay <laughs> yeah bring her back too because the, the new one is she's yeah she's struggling with uh the biden administration's implosion i don't want to get political why did i just say that i'm gonna cut that out so some thoughts. So we start with the Word of God, right? That's our, our litmus, our, our, our measuring stick. So Jesus is the Word, and the Father, this is a thought I had this week, the Father of lies is the opposite of the Word, because the Word is truth, and Satan is all about undermining truth. So just an interesting juxtaposition there between Jesus and Satan, not that they're like yin-yang equals, you know, but... Um, obviously Satan being a created being and Jesus not, but I think it's interesting that he's called the word and we know that word as truth. And then his opposition is the father of lies. So right from the beginning of Genesis, we see the father of lies try to distort the truth of the word of God, you know, as he's, uh, talking to Adam and Eve and so on. And then I'm just reminded in the Bible 
you know, Jesus talking about the law, um, every jot and tittle of his words are important. The smallest part of a letter is a, a jot or a tittle. And those will in no wise pass away. So, with that kind of foundation, from the start of the Bible, we must be precise in noticing how the original language, which is Hebrew in the Old Testament, or Greek for the Septuagint Old Testament, and also New Testament, uses every letter and grammatical syntax. Because, obviously, we all know, right, that English translations are going to get some things wrong. They're going to choose words that in 2023, we understand a certain way, and you go back even hundreds of years, like King James Bible, I think was 1600s, was it? Uh, 1611. 1611, there you go, Don. Um, Uses the English language differently. Um, And if you had a chance to watch the debate with Doug Hamm and Doug Woodward on the gap theory and so on, um, that's one point that Doug Woodward brought up is on that word replenish, and we'll get into that. Um, He's like, well, I think the King James translators used that word on purpose. They could have used the word plenish. Um, But then Doug Hamp makes the point, well, we can argue on that, but the Hebrew says such and such. So we have the benefit of Hebrew and Greek being much more precise languages than English. So that really helps us. Um, So the grammar and the syntax there is very important. So, yeah, what are your guys' kind of initial impressions on on what you were th- uh, what you saw or listened to, and kind of where, you know, has your opinions changed or or maybe maybe morphed a bit since then? So I uh, I watched the debate and I found it to be pretty fascinating. And like you were saying, I I ended up with a ton of notes as well. Um, and one thing that uh, the host started off with was that the debate wasn't going to be a win or lose kind of the thing. It was going to be more of a discussion. Um, however, it, it, as it progressed, it started looking more like a win or lose kind of a thing. It did. <laughs> um, and and we'll, we can get into that a, a little bit later on, you know, who we think maybe quote unquote won. Mm-hmm. Um, but I guess the way that I'm looking at um my initial thoughts on the subject um, were morphed a bit and changed. However, I do have to uh, um, take into account that I can't take one simple source to make up my mind on things, although my mind pretty much got, you know, ratcheted in a different direction. So, Sure. uh, Yeah. I think that's a very thoughtful response because even if – so let's say, let's say, you know – one of the Dugs convinced you differently than where you where you were coming into the the conversation. Um, yeah, I think it's very smart and rational to not simply change your paradigm overnight, right? Because there's like we have to be thoughtful beings and engage our hearts and our minds and scripture and all of that stuff. So even if something sounds right, it's kind of that old saying like. You know, I, I heard this one guy talk about this subject, and I was totally convinced. And then I listened to this other guy, and now I'm, to- I'm totally convinced of him. It's like the last one you listen to, you're like, well, it's, I think it's this one now. So that's good. It's good to be kind of cautious, especially when you're changing your mind on something. Luke, what do you think? No, I think that's that's an excellent way to look at it. Um, obviously, the Word of God has got to be our our foundation. And if we can, um, using different commentators to see their, because they might be the experts on Hebrew. I haven't studied Hebrew, you know? Um, so I have to defer to their opinions on what the Hebrew means. And yeah, I do need to, uh, to look at it from all angles, but, um, I agree with you. Yeah, that that tends to happen. You, uh, whoever you listen to last, is fresh in your mind and 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 is more persuasive in your opinion uh, that you make. Um, so, uh, I mean, it, it's an interesting discussion to have. Um, obviously, in light of the gospel 
Um, it's not something that I guess we need to focus on as far as believers. Um, it's just kind of a fi- fun side note to, to research because otherwise the Lord would have been more precise and more clear um, this side of eternity um, and, and give us, giving us those facts. Um, the, but I know we mentioned it last week, um, and I don't know the original Hebrew, but yeah, somewhere where it talks about the earth was, was left in this state, it was void, it was pure desolate, you know, and waters covered it. So it's kind of like, okay, creation hasn't started yet, but what's going on here? Um, so... Do you remember in that debate, did they touch on that particular scripture? When, what did they say? Yeah, so the, the Hebrew there is tove, tohe vadve, I believe, if I'm saying that right, um, without form and void. Um, so one of the points that the ruin and restoration, or I'll just call it gap theory to be more succinct, um, say is that Okay, number one, they say that they believe the, the Word of God is saying became, and that is the key word there, became uh, without form and void. And Doug Hamp is, is making the point that you there's no way in the Hebrew that you can, you can translate it that way. And then the other thing is they say, well, there's darkness, and that must mean judgment and evil and so on, and yet there are places in the Bible where God refers to darkness, and it's not its not necessarily meaning evil or judgment or something bad, right? Because even in Genesis, it says God created the light and the dark. So they're kind of, they're kind of running with that word darkness and saying that it means evil, and then they're also kind of inserting the word became uh, without form and void. So, and, and so... And this kind of gets into the grammatical uh, discussion that Mike Heiser and Doug Hamp both agree on, which is you have a parenthetical aside in Genesis 1-2 where it interrupts the the flow of thought. And actually Genesis 1-1 and 1-2 have a kind of a non-narrative they're 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 set up differently in the Hebrew than one three and and following, um, and then if you watch the one video with uh, Mike Kaiser, he he plugs in to his Bible software and does a search for I think it's the the word is vav in Hebrew, and it highlights in red all the times that that word pops up because it's a very common thing in 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 the syntax. It does not show up in verses 1, 1, and 1, 2. Okay? And so basically what he and Doug Hamp are kind of agreeing on is that there's no there's no place in the grammar for uh, this gap theory to happen because what the gap theory asserts or at least says is possible is that between Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and then 1, 2, now the earth was formless and and void, that something took place and some amount of time happened and some destruction and so on and so forth. And so the way that uh, they're understanding the Hebrew is that the grammar is precise enough to not allow that to be a possibility. It's, It's kind of what I gather from them. So... Now, one of the ways that Doug takes the first verse of the Bible is a little bit different than how Mike Heiser points out with, a, with it being a non-narrative. Doug, Doug says, okay, at some point in the past, there was literally just God. There wasn't even earth, there wasn't even water, there wasn't even space or air. Um, and so he believes that Genesis 1-1 is actually the first creative act even though it may not be chronologically in a narrative like the later verses are. But at some point, we'd have to say that, right? Because matter isn't eternal. At some point, God had to put matter or even space uh, into existence. Is that, do you guys think that's fair 
to assume? Yeah, I'm, yes. I'm, I'm thinking of John, um, the Gospel of John. Uh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So I think everybody, as, tends, as Christians, tend to believe there was a time where it was just God, as stated in John, you know. And he desired to, and that's, and that's a great mystery, you know, (laughs) desired to create the desire to create, the desire to have a family, a desire to have fellowship. And, uh, I made reference. I called you, uh, to episode 89 of blurry creatures, Daniel Duvall. And yeah. And he, he was talking about, it was interesting how he described the angels Hmm. And how they were not, not only were they created by God to fellowship with God, but they fellowshiped with one another and that right. they among themselves were like a family. Yeah. So it's like, you know, brothers and sisters and type of thing. And then, then humans were created. So it was just, it's interesting how the Lord did that. And then uh, mixed in free will. But, um, yeah, I think we're in agreement that, yeah, uh, God was here before all of us, before anything. Matter, space, time, you know, he was eternal. Um, so Yeah. Don, you were going to add something? Or just agreeing on that, kind of what Luke said? I was agreeing. And um, one other thing that really, really popped out to me, um, during the entire debate is that when I came to the end of the debate or as we were kind of coming to the conclusions, um, I, I really fall into uh, Luke's camp where it really came to me that the level of importance now, not to, not to shoot uh, the show in the foot here. No, I know. I know what you're saying. Importance, yeah. Yeah. W- as opposed to the gospel, right, is just uh, it's unmeasurable, and uh, but again, like Luke was saying, this is a it's a fun topic uh, to talk about. It's also um, it also shows how big God is because uh, look at all of the discussion and books that have been written about two verses or even one verse, and that's the beginning of the Bible. There you go. Now, um, thank you for bringing that back up because I did want to comment on that when when Luke brought that up. So, yeah, I'm in agreement with you in terms of for the believer, it is a non-fundamental. Is that fair to say? Okay. However, as as in many things, and Luke and I have had discussions on, you know, how how I have an alternative view of, of the cosmos and the universe, and 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 I think Luke, you've made the point that that's that's a non-essential. We can be a believer and and have differing viewpoints, and that's true. However, for the unbeliever, for the father of lies, to twist something or insert something that's not in the Bible that is as a believer is a non-fundamental gives room for more error and more lies to come in. So it can be a stumbling block block for those who say, "Oh, well, there's no way it happened this way. Look at, look at this scientific record." And so, with that error of a non fundamental that we don't need to believe, uh, that's not part of the gospel, it becomes an error that they put in front of believing in God. So, for that sense, it is absolutely important for the people that are kind of led astray. And, and and it doesn't even have to be in the category of an error. It could just be um, a non-clear point, a yet-to-be-understood truth, you know, um, because it's not expounded on in the Word of God. Um, so it leaves room for interpretation. It leaves room for the enemy to insert, as you said, lies and deception and twist it and take it this way, you know. And it does. And does it really matter if um, science is correct? And you know, it's billions of years. 
versus thousands of years, um, young Earth versus old Earth. I don't think it really does. Um, I think I think as believers, we all agree that at some point things happened um, in six days. Was six days twenty four hours? We don't know if it was or not. You know, could could time have started? Uh, a week later, <laughs> you know? right? Yeah. Well, yeah, and that's and they. I believe it's in the debate they address that where um, I think Doug says every time that uh, the word day is used uh, in the old. Te- I think he says Old Testament, maybe the whole Bible, where it has a, n- a numerical value with it. It's referring to a day as we understand it. It's not like a. Um, you know, well, in my day, I used to, you know, so and so walk ten miles to school both ways and five feet of snow. I mean, you think you think about time that is finite to us, mm-hmm. but an all powerful creating God in a twenty four hour period, within a second or sixty seconds, how much he can accomplish? Oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you um, know, so I, he doesn't need a lot of time. So, so God, were you were you resting at you know ten p.m. because you accomplish everything for the day? Yeah, yeah, you were che- you were <laughs> you checking know? your Twitter account. <laughs> That's awful. Okay, no, but um, but you're right, and uh, I, I think it's one of Doug's talks. It might not be this debate that I sent you, but he mentions there's a there's a certain body of science that was looking into some of the electromagnetic or something electrified that had to do with a way that God may have created. And it literally says, yeah, could everything could have been done in about six days. So uh, there may, there may be something scientifically that we can go, this isn't just magic. Like God is actually using, you know, the way that he created physics and, and things like that. And you, you mentioned it in a, in a, in a previous um, discussion, if God created uh, a mountain and, all the elements, all the minerals, all that is housed there, he could make it look like it's whatever year old, you know, you know, it's not going to necessarily look like it's one day old. If you were to do uh, what is carbon dating, I guess still mainstream yep. used, you know, yep. so, carbon radio, radioactive or radio, yeah, uh, radiometric. So, I forget. So if Adam and Eve was the carbon date creation, what would it look like? That would be yep. a curious uh, exactly. conversation I've, with them. I remember reading an, an anti-evolution uh, book. Uh, I think it's called Darwin's Demise that I thought was really interesting. And, um, yeah, they were talking about studies where they did, like, a freshly killed seal had, like, a 700-year radiometric or carbon date, you know, 700-year-old. So yeah, that stuff is is hugely unreliable, and it re- it relies on a linear rate of decay, which we can't say. You know, we weren't here twenty thousand years ago. We don't know what the decay rate is of the of the carbon or so on. So, um, yeah, no, I I agree. I think it's it's a non essential in terms of a of a believer. However, if God says he created something a certain way or he made a certain law or so on and so forth. It might be non-essential for the believer, but it's essential because he said it and therefore anything that would oppose it or have a different theory, we have to test it against. And this really goes back to the heart of kind of my uh, inspiration of us having discussions is Genesis 6. That's where it comes back to for me as understanding the Bible, understanding the past, understanding what's coming in the future in the end times. Can you go through life as a believer without understanding Genesis 6 properly as we are trying to understand? Absolutely. But it's a huge piece of the puzzle. Um, So we can agree, I think, that non-essentials can become essential when you have, you know, atheists saying you have a genocidal God because they don't understand Genesis 6. Um, so it's hear, essential. Uh, yeah. go ahead. As you hear Tim Aberino, um discuss on this, and I think he does believe in the gap theory, from what I uh, gather from his interviews, 
that's how he parses it. That's how he makes sense in his mind of the essential and the non-essential in the Bible. And um, I don't know how much research he's done on the digital language, but um, in the end, we're, we're all called to study to show ourselves approved and, and, and let the Holy Spirit guide us. And um, so. Yeah, and it's, I'm thankful that we have Hebrew and Greek for the original texts of Scripture because they are so precise. And obviously that's no accident that God did it that way. Um, yeah, so kind of leading into some other things similarly on that, unless you guys have anything else you want to say on that, um, is... Oh, I, just, I just had one yeah, thing to add. Sure. Um, when we were talking about kind of the, the non-essentials for the believer um, and then maybe the essential. There, obviously, everything's essential because God said it. Um, there's a lot of different people in this world. Some people are uh, more scientifically minded. Some people are more just like fall into the arms of faith really quickly. And um, I believe that uh, that God uses all of these things to um, spark interest uh, in various types of people. Like some people might be interested in geology and some people might be interested in end times. Uh, some people might be, I mean, that's what brought me to, uh, to be a believer was, uh, the, the end times fascinated me and it wow. just, it just fascinated me and, and, um, that ended up leading me to Christ. And so, um, I think that, uh, all of these, all of these, uh, verses and all of these ideas that are in the Bible, uh, not only important, but I think that they draw in, uh, people to either believe or disbelieve. Right, from all walks of life. And yeah, we, uh, a former pastor of mine said it kind of this way, like we all have different buttons that we need pushed in order to come to faith, and it's different for every person. And and you might sow a, a seed of truth and and, and for them to, to come to push that one button, and then five years later someone else pushes another, and then a few more, and then they become they come to faith. But yeah, I was just talking to to my wife about this this morning that, you know, you can receive uh, God's truth like a little child and have very immature understanding of how things work and not be able to articulate, you know, to a a hardened atheist all of his good questions that he's asking and not be able to have answers to that. And you can still be a believer. But I'm thankful that there are good answers And with study and thought, um, truth will stand up to scrutiny. And, uh, and, and I'm, I'm thankful for that. So, yeah, um, you know, last week, uh, Don, you, you asked about the word replenish. And I just want to touch on that again real quick is, um, if you, if you watch that three minute section towards the end of that debate with the two Dugs, uh, they brought that up and, and basically, um, Doug Hamp was saying that in the Hebrew, uh, it simply means to fill. Um, so why the, the King James used replenish, I don't know, but um, he was saying in the Hebrew at least it's precise. So with that, I just want to kind of move on a little bit to some more creative stuff. When were the angels created? And I'm going to throw out my opinion, guys. I think it's day four. Day four is when it says and he created the stars also. Because they're not really mentioned otherwise. And we kind of know stars are talked about as divine beings in the Bible quite a bit. So I'm wondering if it's there. Now, of course, we have to balance that in light of Job 38, 7, right? The morning stars and the sons of God were there at the foundations of the earth. So they were there. But this makes me wonder a couple things. Are sons of God, again, separate and perhaps created, not in the Genesis narrative? Uh, But it happened, but it's just not talked about. Okay, and then maybe the, the angels are the stars on day four. Or is the foundation of the earth something that maybe happened a little later? Like going back to without form and void, that the, that the earth was this, uh, you know, some, uh, this slurry of cement, you know, like Doug Hamp says, n- incomplete. And so 
when he gets to day four, the foundations aren't in place yet. Maybe that's maybe that's how that worked. I remember from the uh, d- debate that there were um, multiple different uh, definitions of foundation on top of that, and um, so I, but quite honestly, I did not comprehend what they were talking about in some of the areas. I have a big line of question marks um, right through the middle of my notes. Um, But when they talk about like the foundations of the earth and how they were set, um, I don't know if we even know because, you know, when, when Job talks uh, to God or when God, when God basically has a piece of Job, um, you know, where were you? Uh, during all this, and when the morning stars uh, sang, was he referring to where was Job specifically, or where was mankind specifically uh, during that period of time? And then that would tend to make it seem that the angels were created before um, uh, humankind. So, yeah, I think I think they definitely were. I think we we all kind of agreed on that on a previous topic. Luke, what were you going to say? Well, uh, let's let's play out um, your hypothesis about uh, day four. Okay. So, if we were if we were making reference that in the beginning was God, there was nothing else, and then He's doing this creation that's described in Genesis, and it's a twenty four hour period. So, on day four, the angels were created. So in a short period of time after they were created, there was a rebellion. And the reason there had to have been is because a few, ch- a few uh, verses later, we have the temptation, right? Okay. So, and we don't know the span of time between, okay, God rested, creation is done, and then went, how many years or thousands of years went by where Adam and Eve was here replenishing the earth being fruitful and multiplying because we discussed that did they have offspring during that time with no with no trouble easy labor and delivery and they're doing what God said to do you know being fruitful and multiplying and then the temptation comes in so we don't know the time frame is it possible yes it is I think I'm uh, I'm leaning towards um, this is describing our area of dominion, Earth, the creation on this uh, this 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 Earth, um, the stars and all that stuff. You know, the plants, the animals, the humans. Yeah, and I'm I'm of the belief that the angels were actually created in fellowship with God for who knows how amount uh, amount of time. And actually, there was a fall, and they were in a place of separation from God. And could that be what is referenced in Genesis 1? Could the separation from God be where these fallen angels were, were residing in this earth without form? Boy, there was darkness. There was no presence of God. And now God's starting to restore it. And these angels are observing this restoration. I don't know. So the okay, so you're ta- not clear on that. No, so you're taking the view kind of that because the Bible is central to the human story, that maybe there's some things going on in a chronological order that aren't talked about. It's kind of where yes, you're, kind of like kind what, of what we were saying. About. You know, essential yeah. versus not essential. And as far as our redemption as humans. That's what the gospel, that's what the, the book is about. It's about humans, history. And it only touches, kind of like with the, the giants in the Nephilim in Genesis 6. It makes mention of it. It doesn't deep dive into it because it's not entirely essential. Well, also, and it was understood. I think the, the readers, I believe, were understood it, understanding it. But, um, no, I... And I and I like how you kind of left room for the we don't know the timing because yeah Adam and Eve could have been in the garden for decades, you know. Um, so so kind of what I come to is that on day six God said everything was very good. So 
I'm leaning towards no fall of any angels or anything, no death, no sin at that point because everything was very good. I would disagree okay. because I think he's making mention, again, if this is describing human occupancy, earth, creation. So it's a, li- it's a limited everything is good because I'm talking about earth and humans. It's, yeah, I don't think he's referencing everything that I created ever. You know, if you go back to the original, in the beginning there was God. The So he created, um, in my opinion, angels first. But what he's referencing each day, it's good, it's good, it's good. He's reflecting on those six days. It's good. I, I'm thinking that's all those things. Because... If, well, let's just play it out. If he created the angels on day four and they fell, why is God calling something good that he created that fell? So, that? so yeah. So with that, let's, let's assume what I'm saying is correct and everything was still good and no, no one fell day six, right? Then you've got who knows how long. Let's posit years in the garden. Um, so somewhere along the line after, bad. yeah, after that. So that's Maybe. where I'm at this point. Uh, I'm leaning towards the first act of sin and rebellion was the serpent in the garden. So he was, he was put in there and then, then Adam and Eve are there and he's like, who are these guys? I'm this incredible being. There's no one like me created wise. Uh, or he would say no one like me, but. Um. Yeah, why should why should I uh, cater to to the, these humans, you know? And and so he's rebelling against God, uh, trying to to make us slip up. Um. So that that's where I land on it. That it's maybe that's perhaps the very first rebellion because we put. Let's think of it another way. What the heck was he doing in the garden as like a, a you know, a, a throne guardian or or whatever? Um, in the garden as a sinful, rebellious creature, you know, because the, the curse that God put on him was after his, his act of deception. So that's, that's kind of where I land on that. But I know there, there's, there's room for, I think there was an additional yeah. curse because he was already, he was already in my mind, kicked out of God's presence as far as the throne room is concerned, as far as his. Uh, arch archangel position and here he was in a lowly state and it was like an additional curse hmm. in my mind the the interaction between him and adam and eve yeah yeah that's possible and then when did the other angels fall that's the one that i keep coming back to besides the watchers in genesis 6 and i feel like it's really hard to say because the sons of God appointed over the nations in Deuteronomy 32, and then Psalm 82, where it says, you will die like men. Um, th- these are not good gods. They are they are fallen in some sense. Um, and, and if they're not the watchers that are chained up in Tartarus, who are they? Because as I keep coming back to, the third of the angels with Satan doesn't happen until the birth of the Messiah. I don't know. You guys got any thoughts on that? I'm still wrestling with See, when and that the, might and, happen. And that's and that's where I have a different view. And I need you say to, it happened. Yeah, it happened already. Yeah, and okay. I think it would be interesting to do um, an angelic study, um, pulling where all the different references when it comes to all the angels in the scriptures. And which would obviously touch on, like you said, the scriptures you said with sons of God, um, the references of of Lucifer, the fall um, described in Revelation. Um, But it's my opinion that when the original, when when Lucifer fell, he he had a third of the angels that fell with him. And I feel like that took place. And maybe I'm just referencing somebody else's opinion that I've just agreed with because I haven't done enough research on it. 
but I feel like that took place before man was created, before this whole Genesis six day time period. Right. So, so kind of what we're left with when we think about some of these possibilities that you're, that you're bringing up, because a lot of those things you're saying are possible. What we're left with, I feel like we could all agree, is that the Bible doesn't necessarily teach those things, but sometimes it leaves room. Um, and if we go simply with what it teaches, like we talk about Revelation and the, and the dragon swept a third of the stars, at least according to Mike Kaiser, this is surrounding the, the birth of the Messiah. So I'm, I'm agreeing with you that maybe there's something just that's just not talked about. But if we're going to use the Bible only and say, what does it say? I think that event is tied to the to the the coming of Christ on earth. But if that's the case, then you had multiple falls of angels. Well, and you're saying that maybe there's just things not talked about. So maybe that falls into that category. We just don't have a record of it, right? That is true. Yeah, that's tough. Um, all right, so kind of moving on to, like, how did how did the, the giants come back? After the flood, um, if that's all right, we can go there. So, the predominant theories are that there was some sort of second or third incursion of additional angels who were not chained up, repeated this act, and a lot of the um, disagreement on that says, well, the punishment was so severe, no angel would ever do this again, and I think that's a fair point. Um. And then, so the other the other option there is that's maybe through Noah's son Ham, his wife had a um, what's the term a um, a passive genetic trait of of Nephilim DNA. And as we understand the the more recent study of epigenetics, that genes can be turned on and off like a light switch. So you might have a predisposition genetically for a certain type of cancer, let's say, in your family. If you do certain things with your diet and your lifestyle and so on, you can keep that light switch turned off. So it doesn't necessitate that you are going to get this disease. And so maybe that's how uh, the resurgence happened. And some people say, well, that doesn't make any sense. I mean, God went to all this trouble to cause the flood pretty big deal, pretty destructive act, and he's going to let he's going to let things happen again, get bad again. Well, maybe not. Maybe just as we have free will and we can choose to do good or evil and consequences play out based on that. Maybe God was like, "Okay, I'm wiping the slate clean." But just like the tree in the garden, I'm going to leave the possibility that if your free will determines that you want to go down this path, well, guess what? You're going to deal with the consequences. So that's kind of where I'm landing on that, that he didn't intend for the Nephilim to return, but he left it open like the tree in the garden that if Ham and his lineage should be rebellious, that it could, uh, r- the resurgence could happen. Yeah, that's an, it's, it's a, a long conversation, uh, this subject. Um, and I know Dr. Laura Sangler, um, she, she, that's her hypothesis. And if you look at what is described about Nimrod and him becoming something different, Um, is it possible that through free will, through certain sins that you do, you can change yourself? You know, why is it that in Revelation, if you take the mark, you're not, no, you're no longer redeemable. That's an act of free will, something you did. And it's tied to worship, to the B system, to the Antichrist, to this God creature, you know, um, in the future. And now you're, some, something changes. So what did Nimrod do in his, 
in, in, in his free will that, cha- that, that caused judgment, that caused him to change. So um, I'm always of the belief, as long as you're a human and you've got breath, there's hope for you. There's blood, there's redemption, you know, even Judas, you know, that betrayed Jesus. I felt like, you know, there's, there's mercy and grace there. Even right. though God said it, uh, it was a dangerous thing that he did, you know, it's better that he <laughs> wasn't born. Never been born, yeah. But um, this, this, it's a tricky one. Um, That's tricky. I, I like, so, um, and we haven't gotten into this, uh, just I have, going through Ryan Peterson's book, Judgment of the Nephilim, but he talks about how um, when the sin of Ham with Noah and the nakedness happened, that Noah did not curse Ham. He cursed his son Canaan. And so Ryan goes into great detail of how the Canaanites, as we understand it, all these races were infiltrated heavily with the Nephilim. Um, They were overrun with that. They They were full of that wickedness. And that's how when Satan in the seed war of Genesis 3, couldn't do it with the Genesis 6 watchers. He tried to do it against Israel. Once God took a nation for himself, he tried to do it with Israel. And I think it's interesting that that Canaan was this land of milk and honey, and so naturally uh, the lineage of, of the Canaanites would have uh, pursued that land to live, and yet that's precisely the land that God wanted to give to to Israel, it, almost like, I'm going to put the trap right here, I'm going to put the bait right here, because this is where any natural person would want to go, but that's how God's going to judge uh, these these beings, because I'm going to, I'm going to take over here and give my people the land. Um, so he goes into detail about how all these different Canaanite tribes are basically after the scattering of Tower of Babel, uh, but they're all the same. They, they, they just have different, um, you know, maybe dialects and languages and things like that, but they all come from uh, from Canaan. And that makes a lot of sense, you know, kind of thinking about how that resurgence would have happened. Yeah, so I'm I'm wondering also, because we were at that point in history, we were under a d- different dispensation. So we talk about spiritual laws, you know, and it's, we, ha- as humans, we have to learn them, you know, and, um, and maybe during the time in the Old Testament before Christ had came and the finished work on the cross, there was judgment that take pl- took place in your life and to your offspring, the gen- the sins of the forefathers being passed on. Maybe there wasn't um, a method for them to get clean um, like we can today. Um, and that the, the willful sins that they committed, that's why God was even more harsh. Because if he was to allow that, that sin to fester, and the, it's been described as an iniquity force. It's the strength of iniquity passing on from generation to generation to generation. And then your, your tendency to commit more and more sin is, is more prevalent because you haven't gotten it under the blood. Well, they didn't have the ability to get it under the blood in the Old Testament. Yeah, there's, right? a, lot more pr- was, there's uh, a lot more protective nature that God took, right? A lot more... No, I'm stepping in here. Yeah. And no. and a lot of it had to do with preserving the Messiah, and that's what Ryan goes into is like all these attempts to try to take that seed and mess with it. Yeah. Right, right. And you know, it's been talked about with Genesis six that if God didn't step in, um, there wouldn't have been any pure humans left. You only had that core group of Noah. As, as, as the the ones that could fulfill the destiny of the Messiah. So he God ha- he allowed free will to take place to a point. He's like, I got to stop this. Otherwise, my the enemy's going to win and the Messiah can't come. And, and I'll point out this, too. 
We talked about kind of God's cosmic rules and his self-limiting nature. Why is it that it had to be that way? Because he decided it. So I'm just going to throw this out here that if God didn't decide that the Messiah had to come in a certain way, he could have let the DNA be tainted. It wouldn't have mattered. Right? Because, But if he decided, no, it's going to be this way, well, obviously God can't be wrong. He can't be proven wrong. So he kind of, he kind of boxed himself in, wouldn't you say? And said, no, the Messiah is going to come this way. Well, uh, I would venture to guess that in the beginning, when it was just the Trinity, it was in the heart of God to have this family and to have a family that would love him with a free will. And he knew the knowledge of good and evil. He knew that. And so he laid down the rules before, or maybe at the same time, he created everything. Knowing the end from the beginning, the beginning from the end, being the Alpha and Omega. And it wasn't clear, obviously, to Lucifer. Otherwise, they wouldn't have killed the Messiah when he was here. Yeah, two thousand years ago. That reminds me of a, a something I wanted to say on the Genesis three curse of the serpent. God showed His hand there, didn't He? Isn't that interesting? How much He? I mean, He basically said, "Hey, this is how it's going to work. You guys are going to fight, and this is how I'm going to deal with it with this with this Messiah." It was a hint. It wasn't the full hand. It wasn't the full hand, it but was, He showed was, a lot God, of it. He showed a lot of it, but yeah. he still had an ace up his sleeve. That's why oh, definitely, all this, definitely. The, the, you know, all the different times throughout history, Old Testament and New, the enemy was killing babies, killing babies, killing babies. For, you know, there was a lot of human sacrifice because he, and then the, the tainting of the DNA. So it was all these different attempts to stop. You know, well, now... Now that he realized he's boxed in, we're talking, there's present day attempts to stop God. Yeah. I just think that's, I just think that's, um, it's almost a bravado of God to say, I'm going to show you half my cards and I'm still going to win. You know, it's like, he's playing five. Well, that's just it. He's like, I'm going to, I'm going to start with a, uh, I'm going to start with a rook and four pawns. And a king, and nothing else, and I'm still going to beat you. <laughs> it's just God. God is Rain Man. He's counting cards. Oh man, I'm counting cards. It dress is very sparkly. <laughs> um. Okay. Oh. Okay. Here's another thought, guys. So we talked about the seed of Satan in some of these episodes, right? The seed of of the serpent will be at enmity with the seed of the woman. So what if? And Luke, we know this goes on today. According to SRA survivors or overcomers, that they attest in their in their testimony that literally Satan is the one who is impregnating them. Okay, and creating and, and creating this rehybridization just like in Genesis six. So if we take that as fact, if we say that that's possible. What if Satan himself could have been part of or the sole uh, progenitor of the return of the Nephilim? Okay, so if he can do it today, couldn't he have done it back then? Because if these 200 watchers are chained up in darkness, they can't do it again. Let's assume that no other angels attempted it, but somehow this guy Lucifer was allowed to He's allowed to hang out on Earth, even to this day, right? So, one thing we do know that humans are messing with genetics. Mm-hmm. They're doing it in petri petri dis- dishes. They're they're splicing DNA, right? And they're they're doing Jurassic Park type stuff, right? Right? Okay. So, we talk about Genesis six that they took wives. That's the actual act of procreation. But 
I believe they understood genetics to the point where they didn't necessarily have to do that, that physical act. They could take the essence in the blood, just like we're doing today. Like they're, they're smarter than us. So there's things that they could have been doing, messing with the DNA back then. And even teaching us, we, you know, we talk about the exchange of knowledge that took place in the past. I believe there is, um, Pastor Doug Rigg believes this. Um, he references when Jesus is tempted by Lucifer and he, um, he's shown him all the, the nations of the world. And it's very possible that what Lucifer was showing Jesus was future kingdoms. You know, like, you know, all this is available to you if you bow down and wor worship me. Well, how many human men have actually sold their soul, has, has given over and done this exchange um, for knowledge and stuff? So I don't know. I, I feel like um, I forget your question. Exactly, well, I was but... I was positing the idea that that we know with SRA overcomers, their testimony is they literally were impregnated by Satan himself. So if that hybridization is going on today... Couldn't it have gone on long ago, leading to a resurgence of Nephilim? Because he's not chained up in darkness, never to do it again. Very true. So that that would lay to the thought that there could have been and probably was another incursion that didn't receive that same judgment, or just him. And as or well, the, the way Pastor Doug um, describes it hearing that from multiple te uh, sources okay he he's of the opinion the devil knows his talking about Lucifer the head one knows his days are short and he's pulling out all stops to bring forth his Antichrist the op the opposite Messiah and he's willing to commit you could say the, the worst sin or the original sin, you want, <laughs> however you want to look at it. Uh, like he's willing to do whatever it takes to try to stop God, even to that point. he's already seen the judgment of those watcher angels yeah exactly so yeah it, it is an interesting uh road you could go down uh la Missouli talks about it with uh and even the pentagon released information about people being abducted and the pregnancies and they confirm the pregnancies and yeah. confirming pregnancies and then the the babies are gone so there is a, a something uh, sinister going on yep. under the surface. Yeah, and L.A. puts it this way, that Satan is outnumbered two to one. You know, he's got a third of the angels, and he's got the demons, if we want to call those a different class, which I believe they are, a different spirit. But, um, yeah, so he's he's trying to build an army, is, is one manner of thought, and through this hybridization program. Um yeah, so I th I think it would be excellent for us to to go through Ryan Peterson's book Judgment of the Nephilim uh because he he does a really good job of getting into um kind of the, the tracking the biblical Old Testament narrative of how God preserved the the seed of of the Messiah over and over and there was a, there's a lot more attempts uh at corrupting that seed than than even we've talked about with the big one with Genesis six. There's a lot more attempts that Satan has, and 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 they're in well-known stories, but we just don't realize. Oh, that that Hivite or Hittite or whatever that you know that raped so and so. That was that was likely Nephilim DNA because that tribe is identified with the Canaanites. So um, I think that would be really good to get into, and. Um, yeah, with that, I think we're going to have to save uh, Mount Hermon versus the Jordan River for another time. And then uh, maybe if, if we do want to all uh, get that book, um, then we can we can just jump to that section so you guys can be kind of read up on it. And then, yeah, I want to get into kind of the gates of hell and transfiguration at Mount Hermon 
as well. And then kind of some of my own theory on maybe Mount Hermon and Jordan River are not opposite theories of the Watchers event, but they actually could be tied one and the same. Um, and that is, and I'll just drop this little teaser because I found out that guess where the headwaters of the Jordan is, guys? Mount Hermon. Oh, is it really? Isn't that something? So they both might be right. The Book of Enoch and uh, Ryan might be right. Um, so we can get into that. And then, yeah, and then we can touch on dinosaurs and Job. It's got some thoughts on that. And, yeah, we, we touched on most most of the other stuff. So, um, yeah, we'll save it for next time. But this was great. Anything else you guys want to say? One thing from me. Yeah. Um, SRA, what does that mean? Satanic ritual abuse. And we're, okay. we're going to dive into that and discuss in much more detail in the future. Luke and I would both like to do that, I think. And the late Pastor Doug Riggs uh, was a forerunner of counseling these women. Also, Russ Dizdar, um, Pastor. Um, both of them were the tip of the spear as far as, um, counseling, um, the Lord used them and placed survivors in their path, probably because they, that was just part of their destiny to, to learn, to expose, to have the, uh, 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 the ability to um, help them through the process to healing. And so you have survivors from around the world from those two men primarily, and there's others. And now I'm, I'm, I've got a book. Um, so it's a survivor. She's, a, she's helping other survivors, you know, um, in Texas. So there's, it's, it's, it's coming out their stories of testimony, um, of what they've been through. They don't know one another, but their stories are, are aligning of, of experiences, what they've seen, um, because of the trauma they experience at a young age, uh, even at an infant age, it's called, uh, DID or multi-personality disorder. Um, disas- disassociation identity disorder is what they renamed it. And um, it, so as they're, they're getting their mental capacity or their, their parts are coming together and being healed, they're, they're remembering. It's like a timestamp when the trauma took place at age five and there's a split took place. There's memories that will be, recorded by that part and when there's integration uh, a wholeness of their mind memories come flooding back and they're able to recount things when they were young and that's where the stories from different people around the world as they're sharing it with their counselors or their pastors or whatever during the healing or just you know testifying what the holy spirit is helping them heal the stories are coming together and, and, um, you know, in the mouth of two or more, more witnesses, you know, it's being established. That's right. Truths. And and same with abductees, uh, UFO abductees are having similar experiences. Um, right. L.A. Marzulli has in one of his videos, the doctors in a hospital or, or clinic are, confirming there is some sort of implant in this guy's leg okay they can see it that's on the x-ray all this stuff it even has like a computer clock speed like this thing is 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 processing information okay and so then they plan a surgery to remove it and what happens they show up for the surgery a few weeks later and all the tests that they confirmed we know exactly where it is everything that they found this thing is cloaked, and they can't find it. It's not showing up on any of their instruments. And so in the middle of a bunch of uh, you know unbelievers, L.A. is like, you know, I think, um, I think there's something spiritual going on here, and I'm just going to pray. And he said, God, if, 
if there is something that is uh, masking this thing, uh, I pray that you'd break that power uh, and you would do it soon. And within about two minutes, it showed up. So the enemy was trying to hide this implant. And so that's, that's one of the things that's going on with abductees in addition to taking the, 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 the eggs and the semen and, you know, then they re-abduct them and say, here are your children and so on. These things are going on. And if we haven't done a deep dive on that yet, I mean, we will. But that's kind of why we're talking about Genesis 6 is because this and the days of Noah, that's why we called it that, is these things are coming again. They are happening again, and they are going to play a part in the end times. Um, and so these, yeah, these poor women with uh, the ritual abuse, they're actually doing things while that fetus is developing. They're, they're doing rituals. They're doing satanic prayers and all. So they're dedicated to that life before they're even out of the womb. Um, so one it, of the interesting yeah. things described um, an, uh, a minister um, in Texas has described it like this. The difference between someone that just has some trauma as a young person and, and they have a split personality versus someone that's an SRA survivor. So the biggest difference would be both of them have splintering that takes place during the trauma, but the one that doesn't have a handler or it's not purposeful splitting, there's no programming going on. It's just broken puzzle pieces over here. So if, if when, when there's someone that's an SRA situation, the trauma is taking place on purpose with the organization and the programming to use those split personalities for a purpose. Um, you could almost look at it like a Jason Bourne type of thing. Well, like the MK, you know, MK Ultra, right? It's 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 MK Ultra. Um, Joseph Mengele was um, one of the pioneers of this technology. So that's a research right there on on what he did and what he did after. Uh, World War II. Because they learned that trauma creates this. Correct. Right? Yeah. Yeah, so that's a whole whole avenue, but um, Yeah. Well, we're going to get into that for sure, Don. Good good question, and um, yeah, Luke's got more more um, uh, more of a deep dive into that than I have, but, you know, he introduced me to Doug Riggs, and uh, unfortunately he's no longer with us, but his ministry lives on, his website, his videos are all still intact. So that's a lot of good information that we can get into. And, of course, Dr. Laura Sanger as well touches on it. And um, and it's and it's tied into, you know, her book on the Federal Reserve, which is tied into Canaanite altars who were, you know, again, Canaanite, that's Nephilim, uh, here in America with uh, uh, Jekyll Island. Uh, the formation of the Federal Reserve System, and there was a Canaanite altar right under Rockefeller's house where they had that secret meeting. Just incredible geographical evil uh, in that place. And that's that's another uh, uh, show I want to do with you guys is talking about Tim Benz's testimony as he was a prayer warrior breaking these Canaanite altars around the world. So, What was the um, the subject or the title? Spiritual mapping? Yeah. Yeah, I did think it was spiritual that, mapping. Or that, maybe Dr. Laura used that. Dr. Laura did because she she looks at generational iniquity in, in, in four big categories having to do with blood sacrifice and... Yeah. And, and then I know, yeah. Don, you wanted to touch on um, one week um, looking at music. Um, yeah. And how the, how the enemy and Lucifer is described in the Bible as being a musical uh, angel. And how he more than, I mean, not more than God, but I mean, he's the creator of everything. But that is a powerful tool to influence culture and to influence the youth and and to affect emotional responses and stuff. Yeah. Um, I've heard of that. I was, I was, I I was, uh, you ever seen an old movie back from the 80s, Amadeus? With so Mozart. good! It's so good. It's Have you seen it, Don? But 
I I've seen I've seen um, parts of it. I have not seen the whole thing, and I I have to stream it or something. But that's that's one of my bucket list movies. Oh, for it's sure. fantastic! Yeah, but it 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 so it's classical. Obviously, Mozart was, but could it, an instrument as simple as a piano or an orchestra or something without words, you know, um, a melody. Uh, acoustic guitar, electric guitar, are there, is there frequencies that, or maybe it's not just the frequencies. It could be, it could be the, like the, the Bible describes out of the, the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So it's what you, you put could, into it. You could do, yes, you could, you could bring out blessings or you could bring out curses. So it's the motivation of the heart so maybe if it's the motivation of the composer or the one that's writing the notes, it think of Lord of the Rings when Sauron is creating the One Ring. It says mm-hmm. in it he poured his hatred, his malice. Oh, interesting. So his spirit was put into that, mm-hmm. and I th- I think that's uh, that definitely ties into the music realm. It's what you put into it. And and I think that's where the Lord is getting at when he says that his people, what he desires, is that we worship him in spirit and in truth. So there's a level of focus, a level of motivation that's coming from our innermost part that when it's pure, it is pleasing to God. But you can have a tainted version where the Lord says, you know, yeah, your words say one thing, but your heart is far from me. So you got to, he look, he looks at the motivation of the worship too. I think this ties you back, know. back to the, the talk that we had a while ago on, on frequencies and how these things can affect, you know, healing and disease. And, you know, you play classical music with your plants and they, they're healthier and the power of words. And I think there's, yeah, there's something all tied together. And then another thought I had too briefly was just on the, like this, I've heard talk of the CIA kind of weaponizing music to an extent to affect, you know, the youth. And the, it was used to be rock and roll and heavy metal. And then when that wasn't an effective enough, here comes rap music. And, and now that's, that's the dominant culture. And I'm not trying to disparage either genre one bit. Um, or say that they're bad in and of themselves, but I believe that these are tools that can be used. So, no, um, that that reminds me of a story of um, it might have been a missionary that was in like Haiti, Jamaica, somewhere over there, and they had some young people with them, um, whether it was kids or 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 guests, I don't know, but they brought some of this American music with them, and the locals heard the beats heard the, and they were uh, very critical of it because they recognized the source of that music, not just the lyrics, the music had ties to voodoo and some of these uh, pagan religions that was in that culture. And it's like, you're bringing that to our area. You're supposed to be helping us. Wow. It's like, we, we don't want to hear that music. That's interesting. It's a negative. It's a negative thing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and again, we don't want to be dogmatic about it, but maybe it is like you said with the spirit that is in it too. That that it can have some some the hatred, the mm, you know, the the violence, the the Hmm. tone, the you know. That's interesting. Well, we got to have. I mean, as believers, we got to have all things on the table as far as where where God wants us to move. And I I always go back to. Uh, my my friends that I was in a band with and roommates with years ago, they grew up Baptist, and at one point their church leaders told their dad, you got to get rid of all your rock and roll records. That's evil. And they basically just told him in a legalistic way, get rid of them. And that stuck in their minds because, you know, as a way that they rebelled, and they're not Christians now, and 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 they look at that as a negative. And I agree. Like, if you do that from the outside in, that's not the way it's supposed to work. It's supposed to be from the inside out, the Holy Spirit bringing conviction. And it's different for different people in some of these things. We can't be legalistic and make man-made rules about them. 
But you, yeah. but I always thought it was so sad that that church, while they were well meaning, they complete. It's like getting gastric bypass surgery. You know, yeah, you're going to lose a hundred pounds, but you haven't done any of the heart work that it takes to overcome your overeating, your bad habits, and everything. So everything on the inside that brought out that physical appearance is still there. And so you're bypassing the work of the Holy Spirit when you just legalistically say, you don't listen to this music and don't go to, you know, like my wife grew up, can't play cards, can't go to movies, no no dancing. All these things are bad. And we never want to equate those with the Bible. And, and what you're doing is you're dealing with the... The end result, and you're not dealing with the heart. Yeah, God cares because, about the journey. You know, it, it, it's the it's the root of the matter that that is God is trying to get to. I know, uh, right? Excellent. Well, with that, we'll wrap up. And um, yeah, so let's talk uh, Ryan Peterson's book a little bit this week. See what you guys think, and then we'll get into Mount Hermon and uh, Gates of Hell and the Jesus Transfiguration and some of that stuff. Sound good? Sounds good. work. All right, fellas. All right, until next time, have a good weekend. Thanks for listening to the Days of Noah podcast. We appreciate you tuning in again this week. Please don't forget to give us a positive review or even just click the five stars. Share it with your family and friends just to get the word out more towards helping people understand the Bible better, understanding the world better. That's all we're aiming to do, and we don't uh, pretend to have all the answers, of course, but as we are encouraged to do in God's word, to search out these things and see if they be so and to test all things and hold fast to what is good. So God bless and we'll see you next week.